In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Here we go. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Hello, folks. Ryan Roxy with you here. Welcome back to another episode of In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. Today we have Joel Hoekstra, guitar player of Whitesnake. So much more, so many more bands, so many more projects. But today, the hotel room we are talking to you from, you are the guitarist of Whitesnake. Welcome to the show. Thanks so much, dude. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. Well, I mean... When I'm going back looking at your history as a guitarist, you have been involved in a lot of different, I would say, in the trenches qualifying bands and projects and artists. You know, I, I see here that you've been sh playing guitar for Cher, uh, Night Ranger, uh, Trans Siberian Orchestra, just to name a few right off the bat. Um, what is it? that drives you to be this guitar player that works with so many different types of music and types of projects? Financial desperation. <laughs> no, no, I, I mean, I, hey, it, it, it's, uh, a lot of it is just wanting to make the most of life and, uh, and feeling blessed to have the opportunities. So, you know, motivation, uh, but there is some of it is like to make a living and like, while wow, you have the opportunity because I've been that guy who didn't, wasn't doing well at all. You know, it's been, I've taken the long road for sure. So being a guy who's had like not a lot of work and not a lot of money and had that whole experience, I don't want to, I don't want to go back to that ever again. So I try to do as much work as I can, work as hard as I can, be appreciative every moment of the day, just try and be productive every day. There you go, bro. Do you have a certain job that you can look back upon before you were making a steady paycheck as a guitar player that you go... That's a job I had. Um, I don't deny it. I, I'm not unproud of the fact that I did it, but it makes me, inspires me never to do it again and remain a guitar player. Do you have that? Uh, I mean, not really. I, I've, I've been doing it, uh, making my living as a guitar player slash teacher since the time I was about 21 years old. Like that, that's all my money's come from guitar since that age. I, but it was a lot of teaching. I used to teach for that period of time in my twenties, I was teaching 70 students a week and kind of supplementing that dough with gigs, if that makes sense. So I was like the guy playing with his own band, like once every like two weeks or something, but my money was coming from teaching. Uh, so maybe that, but I don't really mind teaching. I, it's just, mm -hmm. I don't, I, I prefer to perform if I can, like actually gig than to teach, but uh, I don't mind teaching. It's, it's cool. For me, teaching really actually is the ultimate way of passing the torch of rock and roll on to the next generation. And we do have a similarity like that because I was teaching at a pretty young age, 21 years old. When did you start? Plane. When did when did the student become the teacher? If if you started teaching regular, uh, I started playing at eleven, but I actually started teaching lessons like to fellow high schoolers. I think when I was like fourteen, because there'd be there, you know a lot of people start at that age. So it wasn't that I was all that great. I don't want to make it sound like I was this amazing guitar player when I was fourteen. I was I I was practicing really hard and and going and getting after it but it was probably just getting somebody who wanted to learn like a g chord and me giving them a lesson or like teaching them some so a couple riffs or something but uh I, that that's kind of when i began doing the teaching thing i'm just going to take a shot out of the dart because the more that i listen to you the more i can pick up on a few similarities of our upbringing as far as guitar first riff you ever learned i'm going to guess smoke on the water Paranoid. Paranoid. Oh, okay. Missed it yeah, by that much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. But as far as the guitar, because I, I love this sort of line of questioning that we get into is, you know, passing the torch on to the next generation of guitar players. Is there sort of a golden ticket or sort of a golden nugget of information you could pass on to someone that is just picking up a guitar, just learning that maybe would help them fast track their way into playing guitar. 
Uh, well, I think in the early going, it's really, really important not to take any days off. Even if you pick it up for five minutes, I think that still counts as uh, positive uh, momentum. What happens when you start is it slips away quicker than after you've been playing for a very long time. I mean, I don't know how long you've been playing guitar, but we've each been at it for a long yeah. time, many, many years. So yeah. If you took a week off right now, that's not going to impact your playing the same way it would have if you've only been playing guitar for a month. Okay. If you've only been playing guitar a month, you take a week off, you're almost back to square one. I mean, you're just like, you've lost your calluses, you've lost kind of... Uh, I, th I think it goes away really quickly in the early going. So it's very important for people to start to see that that uh, momentum, that forward movement and just play every day. And uh, sometimes that's going to mean five minutes. It's not always going to mean an hour. But I think it's the same analogy that you can't go. You can't tell yourself mentally, hey, I only got five minutes. That's not going to do me any good. It's sort of the same thought of like if you're going to work out, right? It's still f better to like exercise for five minutes and it is zero, right? Anything you do, you're kind of moving forward and you can't make up for it like by saying like, you know what, tomorrow I'll do two workouts. It's like it yeah. doesn't impact the body the same way. You can't double up in your practice time. So, and in the end, I'm just a huge believer in that. It's just, it's all about the time that you put in, like how much time you spend doing it more than it is. Like the, uh, they say that the nature versus nurture thing, right? Like what, well, it's doesn't, people believe it's like what you're born with. And I think they often use that as like a, a pathway out of putting in the work to actually get the talent. In the end, it really just comes down to how much time you spend with it. And I think that your passion can lead you to do that. Like if you really, really are in love with rock and roll, like I'm sure you are and were and and what led you to put in so many hours, I, I that can obviously lead to that time. It's if you're somebody who doesn't even like it, then that's going to be kind of a bummer. But I still think that that person can be a great player, believe it or not. What I like about your approach, Joel, is that you're realistic about it. You say, look, you know, consistency practice a certain amount every day, but put in the work. You can't just wish it to happen. You can't just say, oh yeah, the, the powers that be are all gonna line up, the world's gonna line up. If you don't do anything actionable, you have to put in a bit of the work. And as you can see, I mean, you, you always probably do that with your fingers on your, when the fingers on your left hand uh, become longer than the fingers on your right hand. That's some sort of guitar, I guess, pass uh, you know passage and uh, you are going to lose those calluses when if you do take a week off in the beginning so i really like that advice i think it's good um when you started off who was the first would you say the big break that you had you said okay now this is becoming serious i know i can teach but now i know i can actually uh go on tour and make this my main sort of income yeah, I was a late bloomer. I I was gigging like in the Chicago, Chicago burbs where I was from. I went to GIT and all that stuff. I when I was nineteen through twenty one years old, I was in L.A. I, I did a year technology. year yeah. year at GIT and then a year working at Cherokee Studios as a tech, which was a great experience for me. Um, but then. It was right around the time of the Rodney King riots. I'm going to date myself here, show you how old I am. But it was just, I, I was really young. I was earning minimum wage. I had no car in LA. I mean, I'm just like, I was overwhelmed. And I just, I was taking a look at it going, I can go back home to the Chicago suburbs and teach and gig and trying to get myself a little more ready to, you know, back then it was like the make it big still, right? Remember that phrase? Of course, of course. Make it big. Yeah, man, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. Uh, you don't hear that anymore, right? It's funny. That's completely gone. That's because you don't you don't make it that big, even if you get a big record deal right. these days. I mean, imagine back in those days, the records that bands would get dropped from would be monumental successes in today's world. Yeah. If your album didn't go gold back in those days, you had serious doubts of whether you'd be able to make another one. Now, if your album actually sold 500,000 units in today's world, you'd be carted around as the newest, you know, flavor of rock. I'm, yeah. I'm so, I'm so impressed. I'm wondering if we're living some sort of uh, parallel life because, but my, maybe mine just a couple years before you, because I did go to GIT uh, as well as you. 
I actually worked at Cherokee Studios, not okay, as a, no. not as an engineer, but I worked as sort of the night shift. I worked the graveyard shift. You're a plan out. Yeah. You're you're a plan out. Yeah, I started as a plan out too, but I, instead of you were probably working your way up to technically with eyes on being a second engineer there, right? Those are the ones that they hire in house. They have second engineers employed in house or did back yeah. in the day at Cherokee. And then the other thing was you could work your way up into the tech department, which I did. It was the easier route <laughs> uh, than being, because you, you know that was all about basically back then aligning the two inch machines or the quarter inch or half yeah. inch machines, the, the two tracks. Everything was still analog when I was there and I would print the tones on the tape. And uh, if there was a problem, I would act like I knew what I was doing, go into the room and just basically yeah. pull the the, the uh, pull the channels out of those tridents. Remember the trident consoles they oh, had course, in Studio One course. and Three. Reseat yeah. them because that was nine times out of ten it was a dirty patch bay or it was a dirty uh, channel that just wasn't passing signal. You were way more technical and you had a way probably a smarter approach of going there. I just went there because it's and for those of you that don't know Cherokee Studio is one of the premier rock and roll studios recording studios back in the 80s uh, probably up until the 90s at one point before digital recording completely took over but i went there because i knew that Motley Crue recorded there i knew that yes. all the biggest bands recorded there so i figured if i was just even hanging around there i'd maybe yeah. have some of that mojo rub off on me and yeah. i remember that one Eat little somebody. make it big Meet somebody, make the connections and make it big, man. But look, I mean, it eventually paid off in some way. I mean, you ended up playing guitar in Night Ranger, which was, I mean, I know they were a Northern California band, but they eventually, how did that come about? So that was through the Chicago suburbs. As as I taught there, I ended up doing more and more gigs. That, that stuff kind of picked up. Uh, but one of the things I did was play with this uh, a gentleman named Jim Peterick, who he co-founded uh, Survivor, the band Survivor, yeah, yeah. and yeah, the band The Ides of March when he was a kid. So he's the guy who wrote Vehicle, uh, the ba ba da 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 that song, and, yeah. uh, and he re he wrote Eye of the Tiger and all the Survivor hits, and he also wrote those third uh, co-wrote those 38 special songs like Caught Up in You and Hold On Loosely, and great writer. He wrote Heavy Metal with Sammy Hagar. Was he the guitarist uh, of Survivor? Guitarist slash keyboardist, so he played both. I've heard Carol so much about his tone. He has incredible tone. As far as he was know. just a great Jim is a great writer, uh, just great, great ears. And he's, I think, he written every possible pop progression over the years and melody. I mean, he's just a, uh, a great writer. But he had a, an event called World Stage that was like he had a, had a house band for. And I was in that where he would have basically all of his friends up from the 80s more or less and sing their hits and maybe a new song or two like uh, so i got to play with a lot of people through that uh don barnes from 38 special uh alan parsons rick emmett from triumph uh kip winger did them before so I, I would get to meet all these people and one guy that did it every time pretty much was kelly kagey from night ranger the drummer, the drummer so yeah. uh he kelly would come in and these these would only happen once maybe twice a year right these events but even after i moved to new york i was still flying back to go do them so i would see kelly once a year for this whole thing uh that whole period of time maybe seven years we knew each other and uh, I just basically heard that Jeff wasn't in the band anymore and they had Red Beach uh, doing the gig in the interim, but they might need somebody. And I, I just kind of said, hey, man, give me a call. I can do the eight finger thing and I, I would be a pretty good fit. I, I play a gold top less ball. Uh, okay. So it was just yeah. like you're shooting for Jeff Watson. For those that that uh, don't know, Jeff Watson, the original uh, one of the original guitar players of uh, Night Ranger, had the eight finger technique, which to this day, I've all every time I try to do it. How how did you learn that sort of technique? Yeah, I had a I had a T uh, very heavily. Uh, his name was T J Helmerick, and he took it more in a fusion direction as the years went by. Uh, but I was very lucky in a sense because he taught me that at a young age 
Uh, I remember learning that Rock in America solo when I was 14. And I used to sit in my room, have my eyes closed or practice looking at the ceiling and be able to do it without looking and getting a feel for my right hand and getting all the fingers to work. And uh, but obviously, Jeff was the uh, innovator uh, with that department in that department. And Jeff and I are good friends these days. And uh, I, I owe him a lot for all his uh, innovation with that. And um, and and obviously all his hard work in Night Ranger allowed me to jump in at a point where that band already had a level of success that somehow as a guy who was pretty green i was able to lay credit to in a weird way not really lay credit to, like, i didn't want the credit but people gave me the credit i'll just put it that way um another reoccurring show of in the trenches is how many times uh these paths cross through people's careers whether they're musicians or whether they're producers and how these gigs line up from one to another and you had mentioned that red beach had been a part of night ranger and then somehow years later up until present date you're again jamming with red beach in white snake yeah that's strange right so reb and i met basically over the phone when I I filled in for him on a Night Ranger gig first. So they needed, shortly after that world stage show where I talked to Kelly about it, they called me like a week or two later and said, Reb needs to miss a show to do a winger gig. So we either got to cancel this gig or you can come do it. It's going to be no rehearsal. You're going to have to just get up and play a show with us. And I was like, are you kidding? Uh, I'll do it. And that's why Kelly had sold those guys on the fact that I was like, for those world stage gigs, I was nuts. I was learning like 36 songs and um, flying in on no rehearsal and playing the gigs down. So, I mean, I just working my ass off to get somewhere, right? To, to just yeah. working really hard. And that's what generated that opportunity because Kelly was able to tell them, no, 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 you don't understand. This guy gets like for a Peter gig, he'll learn like 36 songs and no rehearsal and play a whole gig and it'll be cool. And so that that's what got me uh, essentially an audition. My audition was a gig with them. And then that turned into a full time position shortly thereafter. They kind of the gigs with Reb kind of ran their course and then they offered me the gig full time. And uh, I uh, it was about seven years that I, I did the Night Ranger gig. I have to ask real quickly, learning 36 songs. How many cheat notes are on stage at that point? Because if it was me, it would be half a library. But uh, <laughs> do you okay. use cheat notes or do you use just keys? Uh, you know, oh, this key, the song's in this, and then you have a Jim couple. Wasn't, Jim wasn't real keen on that. He tr tried to avoid us being guys at music stands up there. He didn't really like that, even though we were playing a lot of songs, a lot of material. So only like I remember doing some like David Pack from Ambrosia did some of those and that has like R and B changes and those yeah. I I wrote some I wrote some big charts and had them on the ground in always but, on the ground. Never on the ground. Tried to avoid doing the whole like here's a music stand up in front of me and yeah. I try to I've tried to move past that point. I've done a lot of gigs that way though, for sure, with having whatever back in the day of having to just like a bunch of charts and being able to read them down. But nowadays I've tried to get to the point where it's more about actually performing to and being a part of the interaction. So one of the, my biggest rock and roll moments of like one of those moments where you go, no, say it isn't so is when I saw Noel Gallagher of Oasis in concert, bring a music stand up on stage <laughs> and, and actually, and I mean, I, it can be campy to have an acoustic stand now because before it used to be that was the cardinal sin if you were a rock and roll band. You can't bring an acoustic stand. But now it's kind of campy and I can see the allure of it. I don't know if you guys do it with White Snake or not. But when I, maybe acoustic stand, okay. Music stand for cheat notes and sheet music, not cool across the board. I, I don't think. You mean the, you, don't, you don't dig the walk up stand for an acoustic? No, Look, I, is that I see that's campy. That's campy. If you, if, if so, if, if Rody brings, I think it's a great stuff. rock move. I've always liked the walk up stand for the acoustic myself. I I just remember as a kid seeing like Alex Lifeson go up and use that and going, that's the coolest thing ever. Like oh. he's got he's got an acoustic guitar just waiting for him right there on that thing. It, it was cool at first. It fell out of favor. Then it became campy, right? Just like the oh, way the keytar. 
The Kitar was well, cool at first, fell out of fell out of uh, favor. Now, if someone comes up on stage on a Kitar, are you kidding me? See, the nice thing about this is that, see, you're lucky enough to have probably actually have been cool in your lifetime. Where <laughs> I, I'm somebody who's kind of existed never being cool, but uh, so I probably missed that whole thing that it wasn't cool to do it and just did it anyway. Um, <laughs> All, all that kind of comes from, I think, my my parents being music, classical musicians when I was a kid and uh, always kind of had had this attitude of like, well, so what? Like, so what if <laughs> even like my my very first band when I was a kid, like all the guys were doing the hairband thing back then. Right. All the other guys in my band had like, you know, the nice ratted out hair and, you know, of, of course, course the bangs back then. But uh, but I had short hair. I just was, I was like, ah, what do I need to have like the long hair for it? I was kind of like the misfit and like more about like, I just want to be able to play really well. And what do I care about all that stuff? And, mm -hmm. and uh, here I am all these years later and people think like, I'm only the guy with the, the long hair and the look and that I can't play guitar. So it's because it's, you didn't tease your hair out and damage it back in those days that you got the cool rock and roll hair now. Maybe, so, I don't know, well dude. Well played, you play in the long game. Good for yeah, you. Yeah, the long <laughs> <laughs> all right sure i'll go with that all right. now here, here's the thing i i was definitely not considered cool in the in the late 70s because i thought one of the best albums to ever come out was the grand illusion 1977 grand illusion comes out from a band called sticks whenever you know and, and i'm like this is the coolest i'm playing it for all my friends are like no nah, dude it's acdc aerosmith and, and that's it. Either you like those two bands. And, and, and of course, then my sort of like, well, like I, I'm going to stick to sticks. But then I found my sort of Beatles, which is from your neck of the woods. I found Cheap Trick. So I don't know how, how influential. Sticks is as well. You know, that's a that's a Chicago band as well. That's right. So, yeah. So Sticks actually really was like a more of a right where I grew up. Uh, that kind of area. Dennis DeYoung, I believe, was from a neighboring suburb of uh, where I grew up. So Styx really uh, was a Chicago band and had that Midwestern sound. Cheap Trick was uh, from Rockford, which is a little little ways outside of the Chicago area, like, um, you know, maybe an hour away. Um, but no yeah, both, both great Midwestern bands. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I grew up digging sticks. You had to, man. When you live in Chicago, you got to grow up liking sticks. <laughs> well, it seems as though a lot of these things, these influences that you had have led you to things uh, even more on the theatrical sense. Because you've, in order to work, in order to be in the trenches and get that paycheck, you've not only played with big rock bands, but you've also been with big sort of productions, whether it's uh, Trans-Siberian Orchestra or whether it's the Rock of Ages. I mean, you were on Broadway, for Christ's sake, right? Yeah, for about six years that was. So yeah, many, many performances of that. That, uh, that came about right after the time I joined Night Ranger. So that, uh, that was really great because I could take off whenever I needed to sub out and it was a union protected job. So it's not like anybody could come in and steal your job from you. You just basically could sub out whenever you wanted for those six years. So anytime you had a higher paying gig, just get somebody who was the only thing was it was your responsibility to schedule that and check in with them, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so it was a lot of legwork in that department, but it was just brilliant in terms of just that period, I had a gig every day, essentially, for about six years, because if I wasn't on tour, I was at home playing on Broadway. And they were all relatively big gigs, too. I'm not talking like playing for 10 people. I mean, even the small gigs at Rock of Ages were whatever, five, six hundred people. And so those were the smallest shows I was playing during that six year. Period. And those are all stage gigs. Those are not in the orchestra pit or are they I was on stage. Yeah. I did do pit stuff, which is how I got Rock of Ages. Mm -hmm. I, I went to New York to do my first theater thing was this show called Love Janice. That was about Janice Joplin. And I did that in I moved to New York to do that gig. And I was thinking I was just going there for a couple months. I didn't realize I was moving there. But the show ran for a couple of years. So. By the time it closed, I was a New Yorker, essentially. Uh, I was pretty much settled in there. Uh, 
so that was really my first dive, like, you know, theater gig. And I did a lot of those. Like, I, I ended up going out and doing, like, regional theater productions that the director would ask me to go to, like, Arizona and do, like, a two-month sit-down of the show there or whatever. I did it in a bunch of places. And then he had a blues show that same thing that he asked me to go out and be the guitar player in that. So I, I was going around and... At that time, I was also doing a, some band stuff, but more in the oldie scene. I was gigging with the Turtles, you know, had the song Happy Together. Yeah, yeah. So I would, like, fly out from wherever those regional productions were to go do Turtles gigs, and I'd always have to find, like, a local sub in whatever area I was going to be in to cover those shows I'd be missing. And uh, it just... Uh, always multitasking, always trying to have more than one gig going. So I, so it wasn't like I had all my eggs in one basket. And if something went away, I wasn't just totally doomed and going like, dude, I've got no, you know, no money coming in whatsoever. And mm -hmm. you're, you're always like that one step from your whole dream crashing then, or the window shutting on you. Yeah. So. But you've seemed to have done a really good job of laying it out and preparing yourself for the next move that you make. And I think that's important that listeners sort of take that in because, you know, I, I get a one sheet with the guys that I able to interview some of them I know from past. And now I feel like I know you because we do have so many similarities. I lived in New York as well. And I have played with red beach before with Alice Cooper. Now you're currently playing with red beach. And, but I get a sheet of which, which is pretty impressive of, of all the stuff you've had. But then when you start talking and I start thinking just about the body of work that you have actually in, in the amount of hours that you have put in, to all these different uh, projects, it's, it's mind-blowing. It, it is it's a great career, and that's pretty much what being in the trenches is all about, is making that uh, career and that dream that you had way back when you were 11 to play guitar a reality and keeping it a reality, you know? Yeah, it's the more realistic, uh, attainable dream these days. The dream is to actually, like, be a professional musician more than it is to have the mansion and the Ferraris parked, uh, multiple sports cars parked in your driveway outside. It's like, it's more or less like, hey, did you get through your life, raise your family and like not have to do anything else to supplement your income? And like, yeah. you know, yeah, I, I just don't want to end up like waiting tables or doing something like that. And just not that there's anything wrong with that, but I just feel like I've made it this far. I want to, that's Keep for me is success if i can just get through my life not having to have done anything else uh, i'll be like all right i did it like it's not really about being wealthy or anything like that for me but but you're you know i always say it's it's better to have a friend that owns a yacht than you'd have to own the yacht yourself <laughs> sure dude absolutely i and yeah and i'm, I'm sure you know i mean with the, the the gigs that you have or have had and that you you get plenty of those moments where you're treated like royalty or treated really well and it is almost nicer to have that than to have to work to maintain that uh i guess on like you said like on a personal level you'd have to, you'd have to clean your own yacht right it's nicer to have the friend <laughs> invite you on well but you're tasting that rock and roll royalty lifestyle right now as we speak i mean i can see the the background of those curtains right there those are those are not motel six curtains i'll tell you that right now for those of you that are just listening to the podcast this is a very nice hotel with those with those types of curtains that have tassels i don't think holiday inn has tassels these days no but i like to think i do my best to down dress it all so <laughs> i like to be the guy walking around in my uh michael jordan gear and and sweaty and uh, while I'm, I'm walking through the lobby of these places, making everybody wonder what I'm doing there. Uh, but yeah, talk, no, we're in a, we're in a nice, a nice posh hotel here in Milan today. Nice. Well, talk to me a little about this White Snake tour, how things are going, and uh, you know, how is it playing with Red Beach? As a as someone that has played with Red Beach before, uh, for those of you that know him as a guitar player of Winger, the guy is a shredder uh, beyond belief, but. More so than that, he's a storyteller beyond belief, right? <laughs> yeah, well, there's things you there's things you can't unhear that that rebel tell you. Uh, uh, but no, he's a great bandmate, great guitar player. Everybody knows he's a great lead player, but I like to say uh, my favorite thing about him is that he's actually a great rhythm guitar player. Uh, these White Snake riffs are so killer, and we really enjoy locking with each other and playing rhythm with each other. I, if if I had to like pinpoint where we get along the best is that we both we both play rhythm, uh, 
nice and tight together and and we we dig that um and that's a huge part of anybody's gig everybody likes to focus on the the fancy stuff but that's maybe like three four percent of your gig at the end of the day when you're in a rock band i mean it's all about playing rhythm guitar and yeah. and and <clears throat> all the intangibles being the guy who's on time being the guy who knows his place being the guy who's agreeable and easy <laughs> to get along with and that those that's what that's what I think what what separates uh, a lot of the great players or I uh, keeps a lot of the great players, I think, from achieving great things uh, career wise. Uh, I always say it's a it's two different things to be a great player and have a great career. So yeah. um, <clears throat> it's nice to be able to find that balance. And it's nice to uh, realize that life isn't a talent contest, too. And uh, it's not about. uh it's it's not it's a it's a it's about treating people with respect all the time mm -hmm. right not necessarily sizing people up as how how valuable they are as humans in terms of how great they play an instrument is kind of like silliness at the end of the day it's if you're a professional musician that's what you're supposed to do you're supposed to play at a certain professional right. level but i think your definition you just gave a definition of a professional working musician it's basically know how to play your instrument which you should that that's a given but show up on time and learn to be able to hang out with other people, whether it's in a dressing room, whether it's on a bus, or whether it's four guys in a hotel room. But I'm sure that's not you right now. I guess you guys have single rooms, I'm assuming. <laughs> it's yeah, it's not me right now, but I think it's too. I, I mean, you, listen, you know as well as anybody. It's I'm saying this more for other people, but of course, it's like when you're on tour with somebody, you're representing Alice, and I'm representing White Snake at the moment. So anything you say or do is not necessarily just representing yourself. You're representing a brand and something that David Coverdale spent 40 years building, and uh, he doesn't want to see that become damaged by any kind of behavior that's not suitable or professional so you try and be professional for uh from the person who's the the runner at the gig who picks you up in the shuttle van you try and greet them treat them with respect say thank you for the ride over all that that stuff goes a long way and it also goes a long way just in terms of generating positivity in the world you know it's like we're losing that as a society sometimes just simple things just being to each other and being kind to each other right um so but hey but again some of that is philosophical and just who i want to be as a person but it also is recognized that when i'm out with trans-siberian orchestra or with white snake or with share i'm representing their particular brand and you're representing a legacy you know yeah so and, and anything yeah any, anything you do you need to evaluate with that in mind yeah i think that's really important um, the newest album that you guys just put out in 2019, White Snake, Flesh and Blood. Were you and Reb uh, able to play on that together as well? And how was how did it work out with the production and the songwriting? How did that whole album come about and how do you feel about it now? Yeah, really great. I uh, David has the the bulk of what a, uh, to do with what a white snake album sounds like Every, everybody likes to talk about what era this and that and what players uh, with white snake that's one of the great things as uh, same with alice all these yep. different chapters and eras that everybody likes to compare and contrast and the one thing about it is that david is really he's always going to be the 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 chief and the guy that uh defines the sound of the record so it's it's my job and reb's job to support that and and do the best we can to uh contribute so david was kind enough to have me in i think i if you include the deluxe edition songs i think i co-wrote seven songs um but honestly, your main David is always going to handle the vocal melodies and lyrics with White Snake. So it's not like I'm going to go to him and say, "Hey, I got this chorus and sing it for him," and have that become a song. It's not really the way it works with with White Snake. It's your your job is to provide beds that David will enjoy singing over, whether that's riffs or a chord progression, something that inspires him. And a lot of times with this, uh, it it really was David having a, an idea for a chorus and then saying, where would you go with it? And uh, he's very intuitive, writes very quick, which I love. David doesn't like to overwrite, uh, which I also love. I, I think sometimes rock and roll can get 
I guess, uh, overwritten when you, when you start adding like your second and third bridges and you've got six or seven sections to something that essentially is supposed to be hooky rock and roll, you're kind of going down the wrong path. You know, there's that, I guess they say that the old cliche is that the best songs are written quickly. Right. So, uh, David likes to go with that and you just have to be mentally aware, mentally in tune with where he's at, uh, give him your best suggestions off the top of your head and hope that it goes well and 95 percent of the time we're on the same page with something i'll give him he'll be like cool and every once in a while it's not and he'll just say nope not not for white snake and and uh i love that because number one he's direct and you don't waste a bunch of time or you don't think cool awesome get your hopes up and go i just wrote a song with him so you can just if something's not working boom move on uh I think that's that comes from us being together now five years. So we're able to we David and I get along great and Reb and I get along great. So David would either do the song ideas with Reb or with myself. And some of them were with both of us there. And then Reb and I demoed the songs together. So we would go down into the studio. We have a band house with a studio in it. And Reb and I, during that period, just basically used MIDI drums or a drum machine a drum machine, essentially. One of us would play bass, get the music bed hashed out. So not, we're not singing or anything at this point, but just actually get the music bed hashed out, get David to sign off on it. Then all that stuff eventually went to the band. Everybody learned their parts or learned the forms of the songs and came in and played. And that that stuff for people that don't know usually begins with drums and usually build up from there. Occasionally bands work the other way around and drums will happen later. But for the most part, uh, drums usually go down first and people lay their parts down to that, uh, which is how it worked with this particular album. But yeah, I, I think as we went with it, I just being that guy that cares a lot and probably just uh, had more to say than turn my guitar up or turn my solos up. I think David started to like a lot of my suggestions or my thoughts and, uh, t- brought me in technically as a co-producer on it which is probably generous on his part honestly big step up. Yeah. um well it was nice of him because it shows a it shows a i guess uh that he respected my ideas in terms of uh the sound of the record and and what it could be and and like i said more more than self-serving ideas there's anybody can do that like hey man my show my solo should have been louder in that song no, uh, but, about the big picture about song. yeah yeah when he, when he saw that i had some big picture uh clarity and ideas and suggestions and things that i showed that i care about white snake not not me right. uh uh was really the key to that but yeah that that's for me a nice thing and the next step in terms of being in white snake would you say that this is like if you could consider the first album that you made with white snake uh the purple album right in 2015 with that and is this a progression or a big uh, a big difference is it, it did, or, or do you just find it being a progression of your relationship with with David and the songs or does it does it actually have a distinct new direction how do you think? Uh, it's it's a progression i think people underestimate in general i'm going to be very i'm going to generalize i think people underestimate how creative i had to be on the purple album because uh, Reb had basically already tracked the guitar part for those songs. Those songs usually only had just like one guitar part. And then John Lord was obviously providing all these textures, but we weren't going heavy on keyboards. So I had to think what what would be like a second guitar overdub you would do nowadays if you were going to record that song and put it in the context of what white snake would do uh so i often had to invent a second part and we of course did different arrangements and different keys on some of them and uh it wasn't people chalk that up as to like well they just did a like cover songs like well no we (laughs) we really (laughs) had to record those songs like a, a whole different spin so For me, more creativity went into that than people recognize, and people probably think I was more creative on Flesh and Blood. I'm probably getting more credit than I deserve on Flesh and Blood because, as I said, when when people see, uh, oh, he co-wrote that song with David, they're probably picturing me singing the chorus to David or something. That's never the case. David is really always going to be the guy to write the hooks of the songs, and your job is to give him cool beds to sing over. So 
uh, again, it's it's not a. I, I'm just trying to be realistic. I'm not trying to be critical uh, of uh, anybody's opinions of it. It just kind of sometimes you get less credit than you deserve, and sometimes yeah. you get. That's the way the world works, right? And guess what? When the when that more credit comes your way, gladly accept it because I think yeah, all course, too man. often or not. All too often, uh, you know, you get less credit sometimes than what you think. So when that over credit comes in, you you bank it up, you store it up like a hamster, I guess. You know? I try uh, to I try to always have uh, I try to always keep in mind the realistic perspective of it, and, and not uh, I guess your bandmate Nita, you know, with the ego kills talent thing. I think egos can kill careers too. It's not just the talent. I think it can really take away from people in terms of your your personality uh think of how many bands it breaks up you know think of how many great bands ego can actually kill so yeah i mean you you have everything you have your priorities set straight and i think that's you know your history of success uh, with the guitar and with all the projects you've done is is it's just evidence of you having your your mind set and your mind straight on the on what's important what's not i i i'm i have much respect for you after this conversation i really do joel thank you very much for being on in the trenches man it's been awesome i can i can hardly wait to blow the whole impression for you no no our paths will cross at one point and uh i'm sure we'll be doing some sort of festival some sort of show down it'll be be me chewing out like a shuttle drive a runner saying uh get the get the door for me right do you know who i am right yeah but you go that guy was totally lying on my podcast we could just say what no because then we can do another episode and say what happened to joel what happened to joel (laughs) why did he turn out to be a jackass uh you never know man you never know uh i do i do have many practices in every day and i i try to uh and I guess for the younger kids out there or just even people that have been supportive uh, of recordings or concerts that I've been a part of. But it's, it comes down to like a daily thing with me. I think if you break it, if you break your career down into what you're doing today, you know, like you're you're doing this podcast and you're being productive. Right. And you could easily be. Uh, I don't know, doing something that would be hurting your career or just wasting time and, and you're doing something to build and, and be productive and finding. Uh, so I think it's about that. And uh, if you can. Taking a step, taking a step forward to whatever goal you have in mind, just do something. Put Like I said, it comes back to putting something in action. Make, make, your, make your career actionable. Don't just sit back and wait for it to happen because that's probably not going to happen. Oh, absolutely, man. I mean, uh, you, you, especially with the, the, with the music business is not to, uh, because there's many things we have easier than people who work really, really hard labor jobs that pull hard hours. And so we've got it easy and we sound like divas compared to those people, but also at the same time, their jobs, you can get into that and kind of go, all right, if you follow this path, you will end up with that job and that pay. In our jobs, it's much more of a roll of the dice that you'll ever get to the point where you can pay your bills at it or ever get to the point where uh, you're nothing more than a joke to people. I mean, when you're a young kid and you set out to do this, at least where I was, man, I had grown up in the suburbs, people looked at you like, no way, dude, are you kidding? So, no. Uh, anyway and now and now I, you're I, sitting in a hotel room with tassels on the curtains in Milan so <laughs> there you go living proof Joel Hoekstra. so for those that want to get in touch after hearing this find out more about you what is the best way to find out more about Joel Hoekstra? So I'm old school and I have a website, just a dot com, and then you can click over to any of my social media stuff from there. But I'll spell my name because it's impossible, as you learned early in our interaction <laughs> well, today. It, it, not just impossible to, to spell. I mean, because yeah, spelling bee, I would definitely not win the prize. But to, to pronounce and, and apparently yeah, Kip, Kip Winger thought you should maybe have a stage name by now. Is that the case? Yeah. <laughs> it was the first thing he said to Reb when I got the white side gig, man, my gosh, I should have had a stage name years ago. And he's totally right. I just never did it. And I feel like I've kind of missed the window at this point. Uh, But anyway, my name is Joel, J-O-E-L. And then the last name, Hoekstra, H-O-E-K-S-T-R-A. 
So joelhoekstra.com. And then you can see the links to all my uh, social media stuff there. And I'm really good about getting back if you inbox uh, and, and write me and have questions. I still try and keep up uh, with that and get and respond to everybody, um, which is something I take pride in getting this this far along and still being able to do that. And sounds cheesy, but it's true. Cool. I lost two seconds of that last thing, but that's yeah. okay. But but I know it, it was it was from the heart. It was all yada yada. You can yada yada that. Just put in a yada yada, it'd be fine. No, but seriously, man, it's living proof. This podcast is living proof that you do return your emails because I think I just uh, shot you an email just a couple nights ago. I said let's make it happen, yeah. and here we are doing it. And I'm the tassels on the curtains behind me. Yeah. Yeah. Continued success, Joel Hoekstra. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening to In the Trenches this week. And hang on the line for just a little bit more, Joel, because I'm going to uh, talk a little bit more. But I'm going to say goodbye to the listeners right now. Um, best way to get in touch with any more information about In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy is ryanroxy.com. And, um, yeah, that is a stage name. But uh, what is the long, long uh, Polish name? Well, that's for another time and another place. So thanks again for listening to In the Trenches. We'll see you next time. Joel Hoekstra, thanks for being on. Really appreciate it. Thanks, dude. In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy.